Hi there and welcome back to Lean Reads the channel where we share powerful insights and personal growth lessons through great books from Aristotle's idea of a first mover to modern physics core theory. Humanity has searched for meaning. In the cosmos, Sean Carroll's The Big Picture condenses that journey into a bold vision of science, reason, and wonder. While you enjoy what you hear and want to dive deeper, we've included a link to the book in the description below. Now, let's get started. The Big Picture 2016 is a bold exploration of how scientific thinking can help us decode life, the universe, and consciousness, with a sweeping view that spans physics, biology, and philosophy. The book provides a rigorous theoretical framework for answering some of humanity's deepest and most enduring questions. Sean Carroll is a highly respected theoretical physicist, currently based at the California Institute of Technology. He has been recognized by major institutions including the U.S. National Science Foundation, NASA, the American Physical Society, and the Royal Society of London. In 2015 he was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship. Carroll is also the author of other acclaimed works such as From Eternity to Here and The Particle at the End of the Universe. For as long as humans have existed, we have sought answers to seemingly unanswerable questions. Why do we exist? What is the purpose of it all? While definitive answers remain elusive, modern science has vastly expanded our understanding of the universe we inhabit and why life continues to flourish within it. Humanity still has a long journey ahead, but in the chapters that follow, this book reveals the latest insights into the nature of time, space, and even consciousness. Along the way, Carol explores the possibilities of what our future may hold. When our ancestors first tried to make sense of natural phenomena, they attributed them to gods. Today, thanks to the progress of science, we understand processes such as how the sun shines and why it rains. By applying the scientific method and the laws of physics, we've stripped away many mystical explanations. Nobel Prize winning physicist Frank Vilcek coined the term core theory to describe the most fundamental laws of the universe. The core theory explains how all known particles such as quarks, electrons and neutrinos interact with one another under the influence of fundamental forces, electromagnetism, gravity, and the nuclear forces. The Higgs field and energy field that gives mass to particles is also part of this framework. Although the core theory has its limits, it successfully accounts for nearly all phenomena that affect our daily lives. It explains, for example, how light particles interact with atoms, why massive objects behave the way they do, and even how a hummingbird can hover in mid-air. Within the core theory, we also find powerful tools such as crossing symmetry, which rules out many supernatural phenomena often seen in science fiction like telekinesis or telepathy. Take telekinesis for example. Logic dictates that if the mind could move matter, there would need to be a particle as a called particle X, that the mind could generate or control to interact with physical objects. According to crossing symmetry, if such a particle existed, it should be producible when a proton collides with an antipoton. Yet countless experiments with high-energy collisions have never detected such a particle, even under the most extreme conditions. The same reasoning can be applied to eliminate other supposed phenomena, such as telepathy or human flight without wings. We often explain events in our lives through the principle of cause and effect. Every action leads to a corresponding result. This familiar idea has played a central role in shaping modern science and philosophy. But should we continue to hold an unquestioned faith in causality? The ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle declared that every motion must be caused by the action of another entity. This implies, for example, that a book will remain motionless on a table unless something else acts upon it. Faced with the question, what initiated the very first motion in the universe? Aristotle argued that the cosmos must be governed by something unmoved yet capable of moving everything such as God. But when we observe the universe, Aristotle's principle that every motion must have a cause loses credibility. In the vacuum of space, imagine an object floating free, unaffected by friction or any external force. According to the law of conservation of momentum, the object will continue moving indefinitely without any identifiable cause. French astronomer Pierre-Simon Laplace also challenged the traditional notion of causality. He imagined a billiard ball rolling after colliding with another. If you were to reverse the process, like rewinding a film, the motion of the two balls would still obey the same physical laws. Thus, it is not causality that governs their movement, but rather the laws of physics themselves. Rejecting causality shook the foundations of science, opening up new ways of thinking more precisely. Two distinct perspectives, the microscopic basic fundamental level and the macroscopic higher, more complex level, to visualize the difference. Imagine a space filled with gas. On the microscopic level, gas is nothing more than countless molecules rapidly colliding with one another. This view allows us to describe the exact velocity and trajectory of each particle. However, if we step back and adopt a macroscopic view, 
The same gas can instead be described through general properties such as pressure, temperature, and density. These are characteristics that cannot be perceived when examining individual molecules, but they become crucial when describing the overall behavior of a large system. Neither perspective is inherently right or wrong. Each offers distinct advantages depending on the problem at hand. If you are studying a region with only a few molecules and want to track individual behavior, the microscopic approach is more suitable. On the other hand, if you are describing interactions within a vast collection of molecules, the macroscopic theory becomes a far more useful tool. As discussed in the previous chapter, the laws of physics do not distinguish between past and future. This raises an important question. Why do we experience time in only one direction? At the microscopic level, time could flow both ways. Consider Laplace S billiard ball experiment. The laws of physics allow the action to run backward just as easily as forward. The same holds true for atoms colliding, pendulums swinging, or planets orbiting. From this point of view, time is symmetric. However, from a macroscopic perspective, past and future are clearly different. We have memories of the past but not of the future, and we inevitably grow older with time. Here, time appears asymmetric. This contradiction between the two perspectives arises from the concept of entropy, a measure of disorder within a system. The fundamental principle is that entropy always increases with time. Humanity itself is an example. We age, weaken, and eventually die. This process is irreversible, moving in only one direction. Observations confirm that entropy increases over time. One explanation is that there are far more high entropy states than low entropy ones. Therefore, systems naturally evolve toward greater disorder as time passes, put differently. It is far more probable for sand to scatter freely than for it to spontaneously arrange itself into the shape of a sandcastle. The increase of entropy is at the heart of our philosophy of the arrow of time. Yet, this does not explain why certain systems like galaxies or living organisms grow more organized and complex over time. That puzzle will be explored in the next chapter. A paradox emerges as entropy increases. While disorder grows overall, organized and complex structures also appear and evolve. Importantly, complexity does not always rise or fall in lockstep with entropy. In fact, complexity tends to peak at certain stages of entropy's increase. The relationship between entropy and complexity can be illustrated as a curve. At both ends lie simple systems, while in the middle lies peak complexity. Imagine pouring milk slowly into a cup of coffee. At first, the two liquids are separate simple and distinct. In the end, they blend completely into a uniform, equally simple liquid, but in between, during the process of mixing, complexity is at its highest, with swirls and uneven patterns throughout the cup. If we think of the universe as that cup of coffee, the period before the Big Bang is like the moment before pouring the milk, when entropy was at its lowest. The universe was hot, dense, and simple, and simplicity is also the state it will return to after the last black hole evaporates. When entropy reaches its maximum and everything settles into uniform simplicity again, we are fortunate to live in an era when the universe is filled with complex structures planets, galaxies, stars, black holes, and life on Earth all natural outcomes of entropy's slow, steady increase. It is easy to see how entropy shapes something like a spiral galaxy, such as our solar system. But when it comes to understanding a human being or a specific species of animal, the workings of entropy become far more intricate and challenging to unravel. Although we do not fully understand how complex living organisms first emerged, several promising theories have been proposed and developed. Geochemist Michael Russell suggested that the earliest living beings were essentially entropy engines mechanisms that accelerated the increase of entropy on Earth. His idea is supported by the process through which primitive life forms converted carbon dioxide CO via hydrogenation. This chemical reaction produced methane and water byproducts that have lower free energy, and therefore higher entropy than the initial carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Since increasing entropy is a natural process, Russell proposed that life itself was the planet's way of boosting its entropy. Russell also made accurate predictions. In 1988, he hypothesized that Earth must have hydrothermal vents on the ocean floor providing the conditions necessary for primitive life to evolve. And indeed in 2000, these vents were discovered by a robotic probe exploring the floor of the Atlantic Ocean. Eventually, these simple life forms began to reproduce and transform. Through the process of evolution, they became increasingly complex and intelligent. The reason species develop in different ways can partly be explained through natural selection. First proposed by Charles Darwin in 1859, the genetic information of a species equips it with the best chances of survival and reproduction in a competitive environment. This explains the wide variety of traits we see in nature like giraffes evolving long necks to reach leaves high up in trees. But what about the emergence of far more complex traits, such as intelligent life, that will be explored in the following chapter? Consciousness remains one of the greatest mysteries of the universe. Still, 
Scientists are optimistic that one day we will uncover its secrets. Some researchers have already attempted to trace the stages in the evolution of consciousness. Bioengineer Malcolm Meekiver argued that the migration of species from water to land marked one of the most important milestones in the development of consciousness. The reasoning goes like this. Vision is extremely limited underwater. Aquatic creatures therefore had to react instantly to any change in their environment, relying almost entirely on quick, instinctive reflexes. In such conditions, reflective or critical thinking was unnecessary. But when creatures moved onto land, they could see farther and detect threats from a distance. This allowed them to develop more complex strategies for survival, weighing risks and rewards, and using imagination to plan ahead. These were the first steps toward cognitive thought, critical reasoning, and what we now call consciousness. Yet the process by which atoms in the brain give rise to consciousness remains unsolved. This suggests that treating the mind as a purely immaterial entity, separate from the physical body, is not a useful approach. Many famous philosophers once proposed to dualism the idea that the mind exists in a separate realm from the physical body, but this theory raises serious problems. For example, if mind and body are completely separate, how do they communicate and interact so seamlessly? Descartes, one of dualism's most influential advocates, struggled with this very issue. In a letter to Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia, he suggested that the pineal gland in the brain was responsible for mediating between the mind and body. But when pressed for details, Descartes could not provide a satisfying explanation. The development of the scientific method has already solved many mysteries of the natural world. For that reason, it may only be a matter of time before we also discover answers to the questions surrounding consciousness. Modern science has not yet unraveled the entire universe or fully decoded the mysteries of the human mind, but our understanding has reached an astonishing level. The laws of physics provide us with profound insights, explaining nearly every phenomenon around us from why the Earth orbits the Sun to why pseudoscientific claims collapse under scrutiny. Looking at the bigger picture through the lens of science, we can even begin to answer the timeless questions that have puzzled humanity for centuries. The nature of time, how complexity emerges out of chaos and where our minds come from. Reading the big picture felt like stepping back and looking at the universe not just through the eyes of a physicist, but also through the lens of a philosopher. Carol Docenti merely explain equations or scientific principles. He invites us to consider how science can illuminate some of the most profound human questions. Why are we here? What is time? Where does consciousness come from? What I found most powerful in this book is Carol Less' insistence on the value of scientific thinking as a way to strip away comforting myths and face reality as it truly is. By grounding everything in the core theory of physics, he shows us that we don't need supernatural explanations for life, complexity, or even the human mind. The laws of nature themselves are sufficient and more beautiful than any myth, yet Carol is never cold or detached. He acknowledges mystery, uncertainty, and the limits of our knowledge. Science may not yet have a complete answer to consciousness or the full workings of the cosmos, but the progress we've made is already astonishing. He frames our ignorance not as a defeat, but as an invitation to keep exploring. The sections on entropy particularly struck me. Instead of seeing disorder as something negative, Carol reveals how entropy drives the arrow of time, the rise of complexity, and even the very existence of life itself. This perspective transforms what once seemed like a purely abstract concept into something deeply connected with our existence. Finally, Carol reminds us that we, too, are part of the universe we study. Our atoms were forged in stars, our minds are products of physical processes, and our curiosity is itself a natural phenomenon. Far from making us insignificant, this realization places us in the grand story of the cosmos a story that is still being written. For me, the big picture is not just a science book, it is a meditation on meaning, knowledge, and our place in the universe. It encourages us to embrace reality as it is, find wonder in the natural world, and take responsibility for the choices we make within it. So, what do you think can science alone explain life, time, and consciousness? If this book sparked your curiosity as much as it did mine, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And of course, grab a copy of Sean Carroll's The Big Picture to dive deeper. We've included a link to the book in the description below. Thank you so much, and we'll see you in the next video.